I am honored to have been selected to serve as the Weatherhead Dean. Uh, Judy and I are simply excited, thrilled really, to be able to come back to Case, to Cleveland, and to Ohio. The, looking forward to working with a faculty and a student body that are really flat out superior. These are thought leaders and folks that are going to make a difference for us going into the future. Also, I'd like to highlight how wonderful the staff is in terms of delivering in such a positive way to all of the constituencies in the school. Uh, behind the scenes, they're the ones who are driving things and making it go forward. And finally, the friends and, of course, the alumni, the purpose of today. Uh, you're the ones who make the difference. And I'll have a few more comments about that as we go through this talk. The, I should first recognize uh, several people. First, I'd like to formally recognize and thank Dean Mohan Reddy for the wonderful job he did in leading the school through some pretty turbulent times. And I don't think it would be out of line right now to show him in the usual way how much we do appreciate the work he has done. While not here today, I know in spirit he is. Thank you. Secondly, JB, you, um, you took up the role of interim dean, and when you did, I know it was, uh, you didn't anticipate um, quite the, the number of challenges that might be uh, involved for that uh, four-month period. And I want to thank you very much for all of the support and the assistance and the cooperation, the effectiveness, the hard work that you showed in making this four-month period go as smoothly as it did. Thank you, JB. <laughs> Finally, I, I'd be remiss if I didn't also recognize another individual who's been fabulous in helping manage this tradition. He has a great deal of respect within the faculty. He's been a faculty leader who has made a huge difference to the school. I can't tell you how pleased and proud and privileged I feel to be able to work with him you know, going forward. So if you would all please thank and recognize Fred Colopy. Thank you. <laughs> I've been asked by many about the school's mission, the vision, the goals, uh, which I will discuss shortly. And I'm going to start and end though with one overriding guidepost that I, that I hope we all share. And that is to have a perspective that's future oriented. And that would be that we will be successful if we grow in the esteem of future generations. Taking that long term view, the stewardship view, which so many of you, through good times and bad, have shown for this school, I hope to be able to continue on with you in that, using that as a perspective. I've also been asking about the school's mission, vision and mission as well as my global perspectives uh, in part of the talk today. Our mission is already, in my view, an outstanding one. It's meaningful, it's unique, to develop transformational ideas you know, through our scholarship and to develop outstanding leaders for the advancement of business and society. That ought to be a reference point for everything we do. It's a fabulous mission sentence. The school drives the mission through two differentiating factors. Themes, if you will, design and sustainability. I think we've made a lot of progress in integrating those two notions and have, of course, much work remaining. These themes have guided, not only guided our degree programs, but some research and a number of co-curricular activities. I'd be remiss if I didn't highlight the contributions made by Char and Chuck Fowler in terms of creating that center for sustainable value. That's a huge contribution to the school and gives us a, a, a lightning rod to point to for the future. Thank you, Char and Chuck. <laughs> of course, we have so many key givers that I'm not sure we, can, we could possibly cover them all in, in, in one, one talk. Inherent in the themes and mission uh, sentence are four areas, might be called pillars, 
which deserve to be highlighted, and they'll, they'll form the, or frame the talk that I'm going to give today. Three of these areas directly flow from the mission sentence, and these include leadership, creating sustainable value, and citizenship. A fourth area I would like to further develop, perhaps not surprisingly given my background, is the notion of developing a global mindset in our students and indeed perhaps more broadly in the school. While I'm sure-footed, I think, in terms of talking about leadership, creating sustainable value, and citizenship as key areas or pillars, I recognize that, uh, that, that if I talk about a global mindset at that level, I'm not as sure-footed. And one thing that Drucker noted about being a leader was the, the really the only key requirement for a leader is to have followers. And I don't want to look over my shoulder and realize I'm on a solo hike. You know, so. The first I'm also going to start off with, though, is some notions about a global mindset, since I was asked to address this in part during today's discussion. There were 16 leading lights from culture and international business who gathered at Thunderbird back in 2005, led by Professor Monsur Javadan. And they had one task over a three-day period, and that was to succinctly define a global mindset. What's it mean? And since that time, they've taken it into a measurement instrument and have done a fair amount of, of good work with, I think, over 15,000 administrations in a relatively short period of time. And a global mindset can be defined as the ability to influence. By the way, they spent three days arguing, and finally it was almost like the, the announcement of the pope. You had black smoke coming out at the end of each day, and then the white puff arose. A global mindset is the ability to influence individuals, groups, organizations, and systems, unlike you and your own. It's a rare talent and it's increasingly important in a globalized business and social world. Monsoor at a recent presentation noted that 2010 was a bellwether year. That was the first year, he stated, in which Eastern, more Eastern companies bought Western companies than Western companies bought Eastern companies. A global mindset's important from both sides, and we're going to, it's an increasing challenge when I speak with comp leaders of organizations and board members and practicing managers, they're having one, of their, one of the most challenging aspects they have, and the question they ask is, how can we help develop a global mindset in our employees, our managers, our leaders? The cultural understanding and relationship building gained through global business and trade can make a very real contribution to international relations, as we would all know. Indeed, global business can be a powerful force for good, making a noble contribution to the quality of life of people worldwide and even peace. In 1950, William Schurz wrote that borders frequented by trade seldom need soldiers. Thomas Friedman, who wrote The World is Flat, provides some anecdotal evidence to support this claim. As an aside, I might say, uh, well, it's getting flat technologically. The world is a very crevice-filled, mountainous place. In his earlier book, though, on Lexus and the Olive Tree, a treatise on globalization, he wrote that no two countries with McDonald's had ever been to war. Well, six weeks later, the Balkan War broke out and kind of violated the premise. Uh, that said, he recently noted that that was the only time it's been violated. It's not that McDonald's is the cause of global peace, but it certainly is the, <laughs> the infrastructures and the relationships that create a setting for global business are things that do facilitate connections and understanding. Of course, we have seen uh, recently and repeatedly that business can not only be a force for good, but can do great harm, which leads us to the second pillar that I'd like to talk about or second area global citizenship. Global citizenship includes ethics, corporate social responsibility, sustainability, governance matters, and in a term, the professionalism of management education. Business schools have been blamed by some or being held responsible for what has become known as the global financial crisis. I, I don't agree with that. I don't think business schools are responsible for the global financial crisis. 
but I would agree that we're guilty of contributory negligence. We are often asked if business schools can teach ethics to mature adults. I think this begs the question. While we cannot replace what was hopefully gained around the kitchen table growing up, we can indeed teach the responsibilities that are expected of them in our curriculum and in our co-curricular activities and our orientations. Accountancy, law, medicine, board of directors, and other professions have long been required to commit to a code of behavior or a code of ethics. While we have a long way to go before general management becomes a proper profession, a proper profession typically involves tests of competency, oaths of honor, continuing education requirements, and the loss of the right to do business if found in violation. That said, many companies already possess a, a code of comment, and it comes under the auspices of the Global Compact. This school, in fact, I look at, I think it was Fairmont Minerals and CWRU were early signatories to the Global Compact. And we have faculty members here and, uh, that, that have been heavily involved, and indeed Chuck Fowler and, and, and folks across the university have adopted the notion or I shouldn't say the notion, but become signatories or, or, and advocates for the Global Compact. How many of you have heard of the Global Compact? Raise your hands. How many of you know of the four areas within the Global Compact or four areas that are covered by the Global Compact? Please raise your hands. Very good. As a prime signatory, the UN Global Compact as a sister organization, uh, the Principles of Responsible Education, which this school was also instrumental in founding, uh, Angel Cabrero, the president of Thunderbird, presented the principles in 2007 to the Secretary General of the UN and, uh, in, uh, in Geneva. And the Weatherhead School has been very heavily involved in the, the Global Compact and the sister organization, which affects business schools and have been a signatory school for some time. The four areas are human rights, labor, the environment, and anti-corruption. And there are 10 principles that map, map to those four areas. I won't ask if anybody knows all 10 principles. I think I might be held to a, that same standard. The beauty of the Global Compact is it's not Rob Whiting. It's not the Weatherhead School. It's not CWRU. It's not Ivory Tower Academics. <laughs> These are the companies and the multinationals around the world who through tough negotiations have committed themselves to standards of behavior. It's something that we can teach and we can do it well. And so far, as a prime signatory school, I'm trying to do my job under the, um, under the, the prime by saying our job is to teach the principles in the global compact so I've done a little bit of that today. We won't, uh, we won't be holding you to a test later, but uh, remember, human rights, labor, environment, and anti-corruption. These are absolute statements of behavior, not relatively contextually driven ones. And it's not Pollyanna-ish. And I understand the definitional issues. Is it more like tipping when you're doing business in, a, in, a, in, a, in certain developing countries? Or is it truly corruption? There are, are tough issues and definite issues, legal issues. You're held by your home country's definition, by the way. It's simply wrong to engage in forced, uh, forced labor, discrimination, bribery, extortion, to name a few. The signatory organizations not only commit to abide by the Global Compact, but also not to do business with those who do not abide by it. This school has been absolutely fabulous in terms of the work that it's done. And it's been a leader, and hopefully will continue to be a leader, for the prime principles, which are to teach and to research and create a forum for dialogue and to partner with industry, the values in the Global Compact, and the Global Compact itself. It's a pleasure and an honor to be associated with the school. The third pillar I'd like to discuss is creating sustainable prosperity. Or I should say, creating sustainable value. This is, uh, involves people, the environment, and economic sustainability as well. 
I think Fairmont Minerals says it pretty nicely in, a, in a, almost a poetic way, people, planet, and prosperity. At a policy level, all three should be considered. We can argue about the weights, but to only analyze one at a time is probably to do a disservice and come to a suboptimal outcome. We can certainly research each one in depth, but from a policy, it's the weightings involved and the analyses of each that come into play. The spearhead of creating sustainable value is innovation that translates into entrepreneurship, entrepreneurship, and perhaps in other means. It's the core of what we do as organizations. We create sustainable value for our businesses and our society. The weather had already has done this for many years. They've got action learning, experiential learning, company projects, other things. In fact, I think the founder of, or the, the originator of the notion that's been widely adopted of reflective learning. Take the principles and concepts and the theories, apply them in a pr practical, concrete way, and then reflect back on the learnings themselves. It's very deep learning, and I think we all owe a great debt to Professor uh, David Cole and his, and his colleagues. I should mention uh, Ron Fry and David Cooper Ryder and others who have been so instrumental in term, and, and the other OD department members and indeed across the school uh, in the prime principles as well as areas such as this. And to not highlight the contributions Richard Boatsis has made, I would be remiss. Of course, that kind of brings us to the next area, which is the, 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 the fourth and uh, the final one is the notion of leadership, with which Richard has had just a huge influence on, as well as his colleagues. The mission statement of Harvard is, Harvard Business School is to educate leaders who make a difference. I saw that the dean has talked about reframing that mission statement to educate leaders who make a positive difference. <laughs> we have one of the finest organization development faculties in the world which has a strong focus on leadership. And leadership is front and center in our mission statement. We're so lucky to have a, a, an area, a faculty, and really this is not just organization, the OD department, but across the school that emphasizes leadership in a very strong way. So those are the three, three, three of the, or, or four areas that I, that I hope gives a little bit of perspective on the things that we do really well and I think we can build upon and are deeply embedded in our mission with perhaps the exception of global mindset. But I think it's at least obliquely uh, related and I hope we can make some advances there as well. I'll close by observing how important you, our alumni and students, are to one another. The students are just, not just, importantly, future alumni. You're unusually interesting, hardworking, inspirational, and successful group of people who not only do well, but do good. As students, the short period you are spending together is the start of a lifelong relationship with one another, those who have come before that you're sitting with, and those who will come after. The school, its staff, and your professors are also looking forward to being involved in this lifelong relationship. I'm oftentimes asked, we as alumni, what can we do to help advance the school? I, I just happen to have some suggestions. First, and perhaps most importantly, contribute to the school through your accomplishments and your good work with your companies, your family, your community, and society. Make us famous and make us proud. Another way to put it, do well and do good. The second, speak well and widely about the school. You are our foremost ambassadors. There is nothing more powerful than a positive review to someone considering our executive programs, the MBA program, many of the things we're engaged in in our research. These are very important recommendations. Keep us in mind. Sometimes it just doesn't occur to you. It's not that you don't wish to do so. You are our ambassadors. Contribute your time and your talent and your treasure. We understand different phases in life and different stages of, of career and family that there are different things that you can give at different times. One can't really repay 
for a life-changing transformational experience. You can't pay back for that, but you can pay forward and make it possible for others to have that same life-changing transformational experience. I've spoken to a number of our benefactors uh, in the last few days and in previous visits, and they're an amazing group of people who have given their time, their talent, and their treasures because they believe in the school, its alumni, its faculty, its students, both current and forthcoming. Finally, you can stay connected to the school. You can contribute to the school by staying connected. Join the Alumni Association. Stay close to the school. I'll close by saying I look forward to meeting each of you in individually in the fullness of time. And I'll close where I opened, that hopefully all of our reference point, we share a reference point, that we will grow in the esteem of future generations. Thank you very much for your time, and I look forward to greeting you individually. Thank you. Uh, we have, a, of course, time for question and answers. How do you see this school having impact and in interacting with the other schools of Case Western Reserve University? You know, one of the things I think that the president and the provost have both impressed upon me, and I think it's are shared by a number of our senior leaders here in the faculty too, is the opportunities to work in terms of projects, such as with ThinkBox and others that, that, that can combine with the engineering school, that there are opportunities for, that already exist and be, could be expanded upon with uh, degree programs and minors in, in, in the complementary schools. And I think part of it is, you know, each of, the, I just learned today that the Alumni Association for the University was founded in 2005 which really speaks to a legacy of separateness. And we have an opportunity, I think, to collaborate, certainly while each school advances its own agenda. So I, I would say part of it is an openness, a collaboration, and we have a number of faculty members right now that are working across the disciplines, across the schools, I think, that help advance in a win-win situation. But there's more to report on next year. You probably ask, okay, what have you accomplished? Which I think would be a fair question. Or I shouldn't say I, but what we have accomplished. I think we're already there in many ways. Don't, so, that's right. In fact, sometimes I think going global is easier than going local. In a sense. I guess that's exactly what I was going to ask. Going away from the university, being an impact on Northeast, Northwest Ohio, and what is your vision for perhaps the university being more impactful in that area, especially the Weatherhead School of Management for growth of business in this, you know, often blighted area? We, we certainly have our challenges. One of the things I would like to do is go on a listening tour, you know, what are, and, and learn. What are the opportunities? And, and I think Becky was, yeah, Becky, and I think that people like you, that the business councils, the friends of the university, the trustees, our own advisory councils, go a long way toward knitting the school with the local community. And then we say, how can we continue to do this in a con concrete way? I'm, I'm probably in a position where I need to do more listening and responding than I am in terms of giving direct giving direction in a concrete way right now. Yes, Richard. Richard can Richard you can fill the room. That's it. <laughs> uh, since alumni giving is very much directly associated with a really good sports program. Are you planning to have a football, basketball, or soccer team representing the Weatherhead School of Management? I think that um, that that'll be a service assignment in the coming year. 
Um, I, I think we'll probably stay at the intramural levels, <laughs> uh, but I'm but I'm sure the giving can 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 be uh, can be motivated in other ways. That's right. <laughs> Thank you for that. <laughs> yes, Richard. Uh, I really appreciated your comments. You spoke primarily about business, and we're a school of management. Sure. And I think a comment about uh, relation to um, foundations and other, other, other forms of organization would be useful. Would you care to make a remark? Yeah, I'd be delighted to. First of all, when I s spoke of business, I guess I was thinking of the business of nonprofits and the business of NGOs and the business of government in addition to the business of business or, or corporations. But your points were very well taken. So maybe an add on to that is um, if you could comment on some of the things you've shared with us about your view on the nonprofit manager and the for profit manager. Well, the uh, one of the uh, one of the I think a goal, and I've been been speaking to faculty members and and some senior leaders and, and senior contributors and. One of the goals we have is a school, I don't think there's any secret that the school has taken its full-time program from three, co three cohorts to, to fairly recently two cohorts, or to two cohorts and fairly recently to one. And I, I just as, as, as an aside, for a $92,000 program, 60 people, you can do the math. And what we're probably really looking for in terms of development, and that's our, our leader for development, so, so your, your, your point is very timely and well taken, is that if we are, we grew smaller intentionally, and I thought it was a very bold strategy by the, the leadership of the school, grow smaller intentionally, take the financial sacrifice, it can only be bridged for so long, and then grow back to two cohorts, but grow smaller, grow better. And the recent entry group, I think, bears that out, and, or the most recent entry groups bears that out. And we have shown it in the rankings, certainly the 28-point the, 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 the rise. So that was a, a huge improvement. Now the question is, can we now though, grow bigger? One way to grow bigger is, of course, without compromising the quality of a class, is to be able to compete for the best and the brightest. And it's not just in the for-profit world, but also the nonprofit world. And public-private partnerships are important, they're increasingly important, and having folks from both sides working together, studying together, they're going to be working together in a network for many years to come. So part of the strategy, one of the strategies that we'll be, we'll be, I think, investigating more fully is to have scholarships that are either for-profit or non-for-profit, but I think we really would benefit strategically from the for-profit side, or not-for-profit side, bring those, those two groups together, but in the meantime, also find a way to propel the school, uh, when it's ready, back into two cohorts. It's gonna be important, and that's gonna only come one way that I can see that we can safely do so, is to have a critical mass of scholarships on both sides. Hi. You've shared your vision for, for us. Could you share a little bit about your style in engaging all of your constituent groups and how you would be um, doing your work? Sure. I believe in collaboration. And, uh, and also within change management, I think I might have said at one of, my, at one of the several visits that I had at the, at the school, that the search process was a very thorough one. And the, in, in terms of, of, we are probably going to engage in some change. And there is always going to be resistance to change. And one of the keys, I think, for change is, number one, when change has finally decided upon, anticipate and have forbearance. Secondly, have patience. And third, have instant forgiveness. Not the, the fo opponents to me, but for, for me to hope. To, to others and move and move forward. So there is hopefully a spirit of collegiality. I do believe in respect for the individual deeply. I feel that how we address one another will determine the degree that a dialogue can exist. And at the end of the day, that we all are in it together. We all have the same motivation to improve and increase the quality and the standing of the school. But we also, it, and, but we also understand we have different views on how to get there. So then a decision needs to be taken, taken under advice, and then from that point, hopefully we can all gather around and move forward. Sure. 
Somebody said it, a decision is to divide, but that doesn't mean we can't reunite. I want to thank you again very much, and I truly look forward. And my wife, uh, Judy, who's here. I, I, did I see Judy here? There, yeah. yeah. Judy, why don't you stand up so, so you can be, re be recognized as well. Yeah. Thank you. We look forward to working with you and are, are simply thrilled to be back. Uh, it's, it's coming home again. Thanks. Bye -bye.